Hi, and welcome to the Design Systems Podcast. This podcast is about the place where design and development overlap. We talk with experts to get their point of view about trends in design, code, and how it relates to the world around us. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Knapsack. Check us out at knapsack.cloud. If you want to get in touch with the show, ask some questions, or generally tell us what you think, go ahead and tweet us at the DSPod. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. This is Chris Strahl. Welcome to the Design Systems Podcast. Today, I'm here with Nate Baldwin. Nate is a principal product designer over at the Intuit Design System. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Chris. So you do a lot more than just work on design systems in Intuit. You've been involved in color management and theming and design and a wide variety of contexts across a wide variety of companies. Beyond just what you're doing at Intuit, talk to us a little bit about what you love working on. Yeah, so I've been in the design systems space for about a decade. and. Early on, I encountered things with like theming and complex elements of systems. And that's really been an area that I love diving into. So since then, like it's driven me into working with color systems a lot. A good chunk of my work has focused on color systems. Like early on, I built a design system for a product that was white labeled and needed to be customized by higher education. So Accessibility was a huge element of what we had to build for. So we had to create a system where these schools who purchase a product could choose their school colors. They know nothing about accessibility and proper contrast. They just want to put in their school colors. But we have to also then guarantee that the product itself is meeting those accessibility requirements. So it's been an interesting deep dive into that early on into my design systems career. And has really sparked a lot of interest in really understanding accessibility and color and how to create systems that work well for everyone, both the teams that are trying to properly express a brand, but also making sure that people of all abilities are able to access and perceive and use the products that use that system in the ways that they need. I love that work, especially around color. I think there's so much around the identity of a brand that is obviously wrapped up in things like color. Probably the most expressive way of showcasing a brand is like when you think of red on white, you immediately think about Coca-Cola. Or when you think about yellow on blue, you think Walmart. All these different sets of colors that automatically create these images in our mind associated with brand. And I think that's why theming is like such a hot topic in the area of design systems lately. And just to sort of set some context, I think that lots of folks and our listeners think about theming as a product implementation of theming. Like I want to be able to select from a set of attributes or design tokens and have that represent a particular brand for a particular product. Working in an organization that has lots of different brands with lots of different products, the complexity of this stuff balloons really, really quickly. And it's fascinating because within the context of Knapsack, we have customers with tens of thousands of design tokens as a result of their multi-brand, multi-product approach to design systems. So this is a level of complexity and a level of difficulty for something that seems so simple, right? I'm just changing colors, type, spacing, et cetera. But at scale is actually really, really complex. And I'm curious, like, what are the challenges that you all face within Intuit around how you do things like theming and theme management? Yeah, so it is a really complex topic and it gets more complex when you have a system where everybody's reliant upon the same framework or the set of tokens or when they're especially like cross product experiences where you may experience a little bit of MailChimp inside of QuickBooks, you know, or TurboTax inside of Credit Karma. So you have to make sure that everything that's being built is done so in a way that it can switch themes naturally and without causing any conflicts. So one of the big challenges that we have at Intuit is, so I'm actually going to take a step back and talk a little bit about our structure for the Intuit design system itself. So we're a core team for Intuit, and we don't just serve product teams. Like that, I think, is a sort of simple or idea of how design systems serve theming and product is that there's a central system and then each product just consumes that design system and goes from there. Right. But we actually have 
design systems teams for each of those products. So they extend our core design system with additional components, additional patterns, but they also really drive the systemization of brand expression for each of their products. So there's a lot of innovations happening in each of those product design systems teams as well. So our challenge is not only enabling theming, but enabling those teams to explore and innovate the ways in which they express their products visually, and then make sure that we have some platform, essentially, or framework that can facilitate that and can scale across those situations so that those innovations in brand expression are still conformant to a baseline framework that enables cross-theming experiences. I love how there's this um, <laughs> there's this funny theory that I'm I'm starting down the road on about like how Moore's law impacts design systems where like the the structure of the system mirrors the communication workflows inside of the organization, <laughs> and yes. you starting with architecture is I think a really important concept, right? Because the idea of systems of systems and the idea of these more complex structures and interrelationships between design systems. A lot of that is pervasive in this space, largely because of the problems we're trying to solve with brand and with theming. I don't think you can have one without the other. I think that if we're just trying to solve theming for a single system, we're not really solving the problem because there's lots of organizations that focus in a similar way to you where you're like, hey, I want to make sure that there are standards that I want to also allow for some like, quote, last mile freedom of expression. And that systems of systems concept feels core to that theme experience because not everything is intuit. There's, you know, credit card, there's TurboTax, there's all these other different things that have highly unique brand expressions. And so how could you possibly capture all that decision into a single system? That feels like a challenge that is maybe not well suited for a, a single system. Yeah, and therein kind of lies a bit of our challenge is we still have to have it leverage a single system at the foundation. So a lot of our attention has been focused on the token system that we put together, as well as the entire theming experience. So the way that our system is currently set up, like right now we use Style Dictionary and each of these design systems teams could add their own theme, add their own tokens, really just go nuts and create whatever they want. And that had resulted in a scenario where there were a lot of unique tokens for each product. So we couldn't support this cross theming idea. So we're moving towards a completely new framework. Our engineering team has been working for, uh, I think a couple of years now, building from the ground up a CMS for design tokens, so to say, just internal for our Intuit product teams. And along with that gives us the ability to really formalize governance in the back end of the system. So we're working with all of our product teams, the design systems teams that consume our, our tokens to create a brand new set of semantics that we can identify align with the majority of use cases across the different products. And interestingly, like we have found a lot of commonalities, at least in terms of the semantics. So even though these products look very, very different, semantically, they are architected very similarly. So we can leverage that to create this new set of tokens. And then we're going to be releasing out this new tool for all of our consumers internally, where that theming experience is easier. They go into UI, they can modify their tokens, they can see how it updates things. So they're restricted to predefined tokens. And those guardrails really help us to enforce that cross-theming capability as well as other things like accessibility and whatnot, but also makes it a little easier for them to do it as well. That has been a challenge for our consumers is creating and maintaining themes. When it's all in style dictionary, it's kind of behind a veil or in a black box for designers. They don't really have a way to access that. And so it's all, there's a lot that ends up getting lost in communication too when they're doing that process with their engineers. Yeah, and you also have a somewhat unique, interesting position of you're building a theme engine and you're also, I mean, Intuit has a fair amount of growth by acquisition. And a lot of the products that you acquire also already have 
design systems. And so when you think about that sort of like bringing folks into the fold across a new theming engine and the ability to cross theme, say, MailChimp into the rest of the organization, MailChimp very famously created a design system very early in the design systems landscape. How does one look at the ostensibly great work that they've done there and then bring that into a place where now all of a sudden all the work that has happened there needs to be themable as QuickBooks? That's maybe a silly example, but I think that there's an interesting kind of additional complication or confounding factor of not all these systems are starting from ground zero. Yeah. And that's like another challenge is the migration onto a new platform. So each of these teams, if they aren't already using our tokens, has to, you know, they've got to dedicate some time to migrating all of their resources to consuming those new tokens MailChimp's a good example, like they're going through that process right now as well. And we see those really as, from the design systems team I'm on, those are really opportunities for us to see where we need to have additional flexibility for theming. Like, for example, if we were not to consider MailChimp in our theming structure, we wouldn't have any option for other fonts, right? We just have (laughs) one font across all of our Intuit products, right? But then MailChimp comes in, they got two different fonts. And that's a really important aspect of their brand expression is means this really playful serif typeface. And it's like, they've got some real good brand equity. We have to support that in whatever way we can and leave it upon their team to strategize to what level they want to conform with the rest of the system and what level they want to maintain that expression. And then we just have to have the means to provide that flexibility in our system. So this is so cool because I think that the mindset from design systems, especially within central teams, is often one of control, right? And there's value in that control. There's value for the organization, there's value for the brand, et cetera, et cetera. But in a a case with Intuit, where you have so much unique brand expression that happens in that last mile, the attitude that you seem to be taking towards this is one of like, let them run or let them play. And I think that you're still trying to create constraints. Those constraints are largely based on what the consumer wants. Am I reading that right? Somewhat, yes. So we definitely want to make sure that we can let them play and we can let them have some freedom. That is one of the insights that we've gathered over you know the couple of years of working with these teams and trying to create a framework for theming is a lot of designers, especially kind of cringe at the idea of constraints, right? When you say, we're going to let you do some things, but not all of these other things, that kind of gives them a little bit of apprehension. And I understand that. So the approach we're taking is we know there are certain constraints that we absolutely cannot live without, right? We have to have text at a 4.5 to 1 contrast minimum, right? And we have to make sure buttons have 3 to 1, right? So those types of constraints, we are building into the system and and letting them know like, hey, this is not going to change because this is the intended usage of these tokens. And those are the constraints you work within. But we provide additional levels of abstraction, so to say, within the semantic system that there are a lot of opportunities for you to map colors or values differently uh, based on how you want to express your brand. And we're always open to kind of growing that token set when it makes sense as a system and for the rest of the ecosystem to add in additional flexibility options. But yeah, control is not really something that (laughs) we're trying to go for. It's like we want to help products to reap the benefits of having a single system without any of the downsides that could come from a too restrictive approach to it. Right. No, and it's interesting talking about design and constraints, right? Because I think that designers often crave some set of constraints, right? Like I think you could you know, ask pretty much any designer, you probably shouldn't have 200 shades of orange as a part of your brand palette. You probably shouldn't have 38 different types of spacing. And so I think that there is this idea of constraints that in particular rooted in accessibility is interesting. I think that accessibility provides a great framework for constraints for designers. And then it's up to a system to sort of like say like, look, here are your hard norms. 
and then everything else, like go develop your own set of constraints. And so there is this sort of architectural idea of intentional fragmentation into these systems where you're like, all right, let me have, you know, baseline into a design system. That's one level of constraints that represents that global set of patterns that we want to realize as like, these are rules you can't really violate. But then those end up going into another system that is like the credit karma system. And within the credit karma system, they're able to take those constraints and extend them or adapt them to the particular use case that they have. And I think that this also, like, it's not just about product design systems, it's even about the tools we use, right? Like Figma is a constraint. Chrome is a constraint. All these different things that we think about represent these different ways that we constrain our decision process within those systems. But I think that like feeling empowered to define those constraints is something that design in particular places a lot of value in. Thinking about, again, like that structure, I want to dive into the implementation a little bit. When you think about that idea of like, how are you creating constraints within your system? You know, at Knapsack, we we think about this as as theme contracts, right? You create basically a schema definition for a theme. That schema definition for a theme represents your theme must have color, type, and spacing. It can have shadows and motion. And if you're implementing this in, say, iOS, it also has to have something about geolocation data. And so that's how we think about the structure of theming inside of, of our application is this idea of like, what does the baseline theme represent? And then what are all the contractual elements that must be present in all things, must be present in some things, and can conditionally be present in anything? I'm kind of curious, do you have a framework that looks something like that, that represents how you say, like, these are the tokens you must use, these are the tokens you can use, and how does that work and cascade through the system? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't know that we, like, explicitly say you must have colors, you must have type, you must have motion or anything like that. But the usage of each individual token is a bit contractual like that. So if you have, you know, you have a, a, a page background, you have to use one of our page background colors and one of those tokens. If you're building buttons or some type of element that is like a button, right, we've got a set of tokens specifically for that for you to use. We do have motion type, elevation, all of these other tokens that are available, but it's kind of like if you use it in your product and if you need to use it, then use it. But there are a lot of tokens that you may not ever use. Like we've got color tokens for syntax highlighting code, right? There's only a small handful of people that actually need that. So we're not too explicit there. The way that we look at theming and creating a theme is a little bit different. We're using the approach where the Intuit theme is the default and any theme that is created in our system is considered a sub theme. So you essentially get the Intuit theme by default and you just edit any overrides that you want to have. So if you only really want to change your primary color, you can do that. And all of those other tokens are just going to inherit the values from the Intuit theme. And again, you just use them where it's appropriate. But this is more than just swapping CSS because like you're actually overriding specific token values. You're not just saying like change out one theme for another. You're basically saying I can specify where specifically I want to override a theme. Yeah, and I'm not entirely sure how our new theming engine is spitting this out in terms of CSS. Like if it is full style sheets or exactly how that's going to be implemented. But yeah, it is just specifying which token you want to be a different value from the default that it would normally inherit from. Gotcha. And like, how specific can you get with this? Can you say like, this particular card has the Intuit theme, but this particular button grid inside of that card is the Credit Karma theme? Ah, yes. So theming within an application or a widget. Yeah, that's one thing where... We want teams to, for the most part, you should define what theme you're using at the highest level. So if you've got an application at the app level, it defines what theme it is. Anything that is sub-themed within that is external. So if you have a widget or a plugin that's MailChimp that's going to be used within QuickBooks, for example, 
you could specify that that widget is going to use the MailChimp theme, but for most of those widget experiences, we want cross theming. So they are set to inherit whatever theme is provided at the app level. So as soon as you put a plugin that was built for MailChimp into QuickBooks, it looks like it's QuickBooks. If you put that same plugin into TurboTax, it looks TurboTax. And this is really cool because these things are not necessarily being defined with all of these different experiences in mind because you all have like more than a dozen brands. And so within that ecosystem, like if you're designing that MailChimp plugin, you're not necessarily thinking about what that's going to look like in TurboTax. You may think about one or two other experiences, but you're not thinking about every possible use case for it. But the way you've structured your process of managing those components and then managing how they inherit themes makes them innately reusable across every brand in the system. Yes, and we're actually trying to move towards helping designers to see what these widgets would look like in different themed experiences. That has been a challenge in the past, but with Figma's variables that they released, that helped us tremendously to at least allow for color theme swapping in Figma. So there was some work done recently with our AI features that were intended from the get-go to be themable across all of our products. You know, it's a central widget. And for that work, it was really big for them to be able to, you know, copy out, you know, several artboards and just swap the theme out and see what it was going to look like in these experiences. And that really helped to accelerate the production of that widget because all of these different product teams could look at it and see it through the lens of their product to say, yes, this is going to work or no, this is not going to work because they still want to have some level of either control or the right to refusal of any design that's proposed that's going to show up in their product, right? They want to know how that's going to look. So we do try to help those teams to visualize it for all of the product consumers who would be using those widgets. So with the implementation of all this theming, I can't help but jump to this idea of what does this look like for a user? And we had a chance to talk before the show about some additional concepts here about personalization, about the way that you structure themes to be much more intimate to an individual experience. And I'd love to get your take on this because I think like what you're all building is an amazing way of giving a lot of power to brands and to products to create really great user experiences. And, and ultimately, that's what it's all about. So talk to me a little bit about your vision for where this all goes. Yeah, so I think personalization is the next big step. And I feel really strongly about like how we as design systems professionals should look at accessibility in the long term and how to really enhance the accessibility of our products for anyone in any situation, with any type of device, with any type of situational or permanent disability. And personalization is really where I believe that that is at. And I've put a lot of thought and work into that area in regards to color in the past too. And I think that that's definitely a place where I'd like to go with into it as well, is that we can deliver great user experiences for a variety of different brands And we can adhere to some constraints to ensure that we meet minimum requirements or maybe we go over the minimum requirements. But it's really important to consider that sighted users' needs differ greatly and providing more contrast by default isn't necessarily the best approach either. There are people who have like light sensitivities, contrast sensitivities that need less contrast or less light being emitted from the screens because it could cause migraines and such. So there's really this necessity for products to allow users to adjust those settings, right? I know devices already allow you to change brightness and contrast to some extent. And there are some accessibility features that will improve things, like increased contrast mode on iOS or high contrast mode in uh, Windows, which is a completely different topic. But Everything in between, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to allow users to come in and say, you know, this looks great and all, but I can't really see these buttons that great because of X, Y, or Z reason. And they can increase, decrease contrast, increase, decrease brightness, or increase or decrease saturation of color, right? These are all things that can help to enhance an experience so that it's legible or not 
uncomfortable for a person who has to look at this product for, you know, the entirety of their day, right? You're, you're in QuickBooks, you could be in there for a long time. So we want to make sure that it's the best experience for you. That's where I'd like to take things in the future. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because there's also, there's definitely the accessibility side. And I see that, right? Like as somebody that prefers dyslexic friendly fonts, I get it. I've never been diagnosed with dyslexia. I have no knowledge if I actually have it or not. But like, it's just more readable for me, right? And likewise, like the moment that I go into any sort of like new operating system or new web environment, I immediately go see if I can turn off all the animation because <laughs> uh-huh. it slows me down, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. yeah. And so all those different things are sort of interesting, right? Where like, there's a lot about it that is about user need, but there's also a lot about it about like just what a user prefers. And the ability to cater to that need if I have a better app experience because it can feel more like home for me, I think that that represents a very solid block of user value that we haven't done a great job chipping away at yet. And there's a lot of reasons why. I think first and foremost is like this creates, you know, we talked about the exponential complication of theming. Like, well, now we're introducing another layer of intentional fragmentation at the user level. So talk about complex. Yeah. And you have to also then start to consider like what level of brand integrity are you also trying to maintain? Color is a one in particular where, right, you could really crudely enable increase in, and decrease in contrast or, or th- some of these shifts that occur. Like Mac OS has an increased contrast setting that honestly, it's just, it's so crude and it actually makes some things less visible <laughs> because of the way that it's done. So as designers of design systems, right, and we're creating a framework or a platform to enable brand expression, and our brands care deeply about the color choices that they've made and how that is perceived by users, what they're trying to convey. So when someone increases or decreases contrast or lightness of a brand palette, it should do so in a way that still conforms to a brand. It shouldn't just be an HSL slider, the lightness goes up and suddenly you've got this crazy cyan color that doesn't look anything like your brand's blue, right? So having those constraints in the mix is, I think, the sort of a lofty goal of how you can enable that fragmentation at the user level fragmentation at the system level, but still maintain constraints that ensure that the product still looks like the brand of the product that they purchased. You also brought up the idea of like how devices change this as well. I mean, we're all making a lot of assumptions about the ultimate consumptive device that we're looking at stuff on, right? Like we all view that like, hey, we probably have some sort of factory color corrected screen that we're looking at. But, you know, even my desktop computer, it will desaturate blue after 10 p.m. My phone will actually fully grayscale uh, after 11 p.m. because it's telling me I need to go to bed. Um, (laughs) And all these ideas about like how the device ultimately changes the experience too is really interesting. And as designers, we don't really get a lot of feedback about that. But we also have to somewhat account for it. And so when you think about like a really crude iOS contrast implementation or Windows basically taking blue out of the visible spectrum on my screen after 10 p.m., like how do we think about those sorts of things? And does that even become less necessary as we get better at handling it this the the software product level? Yeah, so I think in terms of being aware, it's good for teams to experience what their products look like in those settings to understand how they're going to adapt. I think to some extent, there's not a whole lot you can do at the product level to try to like control how it changes because the product in most cases is not going to have any idea that the setting is even turned on. So there's not a lot you can do at that point. I do, however, think that the problem itself in the far future term is something that platforms themselves like iOS, macOS, Windows could really help product teams with. Right now, like the near-term future, I see that products could implement something like this for making sure we've got adaptive theming across the the product so that end users can make those adjustments. But really, that is a platform setting. If I go into a particular product and and it's, you know, on my device, it doesn't have enough contrast, there's a good chance that other 
products won't have enough contrast as well. Or, you know, maybe in the future, the the device itself can indicate or identify differences in contrast between different products and can sort of normalize them to a degree where if I as a user need a certain amount of contrast, whether it's high or low or certain adaptations to color, the system at the platform level itself would be able to identify and make those shifts for me. I think long-term design systems teams maybe shouldn't have to think about it, but near term, I think it's a good place for us to move forward. So again, we can help our end users as quickly as we can, but also help to inform the greater you know, software development community of how we might be able to do this at a greater scale. Yeah, and I definitely view design tokens and theming writ large as this big enabler of the idea of how do we think about a more personalized experience for the internet. And, you know, if everybody's using design tokens and everybody's using themes, say, you know, five, 10 years from now, hopefully we can have something and like, look, I know there's privacy concerns here, so I'm not necessarily advocating for this. Hopefully we can have something like a user token that gets passed into the software applications we're consuming that automatically adjusts it to our individual preferences. Like that would be a really cool future to live in where, you know, because I like dyslexic fonts and low motion and high information density, an app like QuickBooks would automatically understand that and make those settings alterations for me that you guys could still have control over with your brand. Yeah, and and I think there's ways of doing that that wouldn't need to even cross the line of privacy, right? You can do this with a setting. You don't have to identify with any particular disability for those types of settings to be known, right? It's kind of like some teams that work on colorblind friendly themes where they say, this is my product theme for people with red, green colorblindness. And this is my theme for people with yellow, blue. And it's like, well, it's well-intentioned, but people, well, for one, people with colorblindness, a lot of times don't even know that they've got a colorblindness because it can happen at varying levels. You may not even notice it. There's also a lot of things that happen in your brain that account for various color vision deficiencies. So it may look normal to you and you may not even know. So there is that you're going to have a missed opportunity, but also you're asking people to specify in your product, oh, I've got the red, green color blindness. And it's like, that's a little invasive, right? Just give them opportunities to shift to fit their needs. You don't need to know that stuff. They don't need to know that stuff either. Exactly. So, you know, I know you've spent a lot of time working in this space and you've actually built some specific tools that help people with how they manage color and theming. Where can people go to learn more about this stuff? I've written a lot about some early ideas kind of going into this, but I've also spent a lot of time working on tools. In my time at Adobe in particular, I built a tool called Leonardo. You can find it at leonardocolor.io. There's some content you can find from there that kind of explains the tool a little bit more, but it was a first of its kind contrast-based color generation tool. So generates colors based on desired contrast ratios. So you can say, I want this red, but I want it at three to one, and it'll spit that out for you. But it also allows you to have constraints about how that color adapts, how it gets lighter, how it gets darker. So essentially, you could create an entire adaptive color theme where colors get lighter, darker, more or less contrast, even more or less saturation as well. And that's what the Spectrum team has used to create their color palettes, their adaptive color system. So that's something that's out there and available if you want to start looking into like, what can you do now if you want to support something like this and still maintain your brand integrity? So yeah, and then I've got some other tools that kind of look at other types of systems like Proportio is another tool. It's not necessarily as clearly related to personalization, but it helps you create scaled components and spacing systems which is kind of a precursor to making sure that you can support text scaling in a real elegant way. So that's another one that's out there to maybe take a look at. Awesome. Well, hey, Nate, we really appreciate you being on. Thank you so much for being a part of the podcast and sharing your wisdom with us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been the Design Systems Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Strahl. Have a great day, everyone. That's all for today. This has been another episode of the Design Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or a topic you'd like to know more about, find us on Twitter at the DS Pod. We'd love to hear from you with show ideas, recommendations, questions, or comments. As always, this pod is brought to you by Knapsack. You can check us out at knapsack.cloud. Have a great day.